Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, uh, good evening, and good morning. We're a very international audience today. Uh, welcome to this session hosted by the ASA Institute's in cooperation with the IHCL platform. Uh, my name is Tariq Gabari. I'm a researcher in international law at the ASA Institute, and I'll be moderating today's discussion, which centers around the paper uh, written by uh, Victoria, another entitled what? The Road to Justice. This paper was published in the Security and Human Rights Monitor a few months ago. And today we are joined by four outstanding panelists. In addition to Victoria Kerr and Nadia Nadiri, we will also uh, host Mr. Richard Bennett, the current UN Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in Afghanistan, and Dr. Dimitro Koval from Truth Hounds and the National University of Kiev um, Mohila Academy. Our four panelists will discuss uh, the obstacles blocking the road to justice in two, at first glance, rather different historical uh, contexts. The invasion and occupation of Afghanistan by the USSR and the invasion and occupation of Ukraine by the USSR's successor state, Russia. We hope to explore as many synergies as possible between the past and current Afghan con context and the situation in Ukraine. The idea is to use these cases of Ukraine and Afghanistan to look at the wider long-term implications for transitional justice in all post-conflict states around the world, including the role of international criminal law and international human rights law in ending these cycles of violence in post-conflict states. The comparison between Ukrainian and the Afghan context raises some important questions. For instance, what's the interplay between peace on the one hand and justice on the other? And can there ever be sustainable peace without justice. What would a holistic approach to transitional justice in both Afghanistan and Ukraine look like? And what lessons can we draw from the past to address 21st century conflicts? And how important is it to adopt this historical perspective? At this point, it's perhaps good to mention that there will be ample time for Q&A from the audience after our discussion. Uh, so once we open up the floor, uh, could you please raise the please use the raised hand function on Zoom if you wish to ask a question to the panelists. And in that light, could I also please ask you to uh, stay unmuted uh, until we open up the floor for q and I'll now briefly introduce our four panelists. Um, maybe let's start with Nader. Um, Mr. Nader Naderi is a senior fellow at the Wilson Center and a visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. Mr. Naderi was a senior fellow at the Asa Institute where he's currently an associate fellow. In 2020, he was appointed as a member of Afghanistan's peace negotiation team for the peace talks in Doha. He also served as chairman of the Independent Civil Service Commission of Afghanistan. Prior to joining the commission, he was senior advisor to the Afghan president on strategic affairs and human rights. Mr. Naderi also served as a director of the Afghanistan Research and Evaluation Unit, commissioner of the Afghan Independent Human Rights Commission, and director of Afghanistan programs for global rights, Partners for Justice. Nada, very good to see you again, and I'm delighted that you decided to join us here today. Let's now turn to our next panelist, also from the Afghanistan context, uh, Mr. Richard Bennett. Richard Bennett serves as the UN Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in Afghanistan. Mr. Bennett has previously served in Afghanistan in various capacities, including as the Chief of Human Rights Service with the United Nations Assistant Mission in Afghanistan. He has been also a long-term advisor to the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission. He also served on the, on the United Nations as a representative of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in Sierra Leone, Timor-Leste, Nepal, and South Sudan. He was Chief of Staff for the UN Secretary General's Panel of Experts on Sri Lanka and Special Advisor to the Assistant Secretary General for Human Rights in New York. Mr. Bennett worked for Amnesty International from 2014 until 2017, initially as the Asia Pacific Program Director. Hey, yeah. And later as the head of Amnesty's United Nations office in New York. Mr. Bennett is a visiting professor at the Raoul Wallenberg Institute of Human Rights and Humanitarian Law in Lund, Sweden, which has commenced an Afghanistan program. Mr. Bennett, we're very grateful that you found the time to be here, tuning in from Geneva. It's an absolute pleasure to host you. Our next panelist is Dr. Dimitro Koval, an expert on transitional justice issues in Ukraine. Uh, Dr. Dimitro Koval is an associate professor at the National University of Kiev, Mohila Academy, 
Um, his current research focuses on the international criminal court's influence on post-conflict society's collective memory. In 2014, Dr. Koval defended a PhD thesis on international law protection of cultural property in the event of armed conflicts. And during uh, 2012, 2013, he was engaged in a project about the restitution of cultural property, international law regulation, and national experience in Krakow. In 2015 to 2017, he served as a member of the Ministry of Justice Expert Committee on International Human Rights, International Humanitarian Law Implementation. He also contributed to the monitoring report of the Truth Hands, the Ukrainian Helsinki Human Rights Union, Crimea SOS, and other NGOs on the compliance of the parties in the, in the armed conflict in Ukraine with international humanitarian law provisions. Earlier, Dr. Kovo consulted the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Ukraine, the Ministry of Culture of Ukraine, the Prosecution Office of the Autonomous Republic of Crimea on the cultural property protection in the event of armed conflict. Dr. Kovo, we're very pleased uh, to have you join as well. It's a real pleasure to have you with us today. And finally, I would like to introduce you to our second expert on Ukraine, uh, my colleague and friend, Victoria Kerr. Uh, Victoria is a consultant and associate fellow at the Asa Institute, working primarily on um, the Institute's joint pro project with global rights compliance, which is called Strengthening Ukraine's Capacity to Investigate and Prosecute International Crimes, as well as some other Ukraine-related Ukraine projects that the Asa Institute does. Uh, she also works as a consultant uh, to address an international human rights organization based in London and The Hague, working on their project on financial accountability and reparations for Ukraine. As a Scottish solicitor, she has worked previously in private practice in Scotland for various NGOs and organizations working on issues of I ICL, IHL, and human rights, and also teaches international criminal law at the University of Dundee. So now I've introduced all four panelists, uh, let's get started with our discussion. And I would like to immediately hand over to Victoria uh, to briefly introduce what the paper that you and Nada um, wrote several months ago is all about. You know, could you describe um, perhaps you know, how, do you, how did you go about the paper and what were you trying to uh, achieve with the paper? Thank you very much, Tariq, for the introduction. Um, so yes, we thought it would be useful for me just to provide a bit of a background as to how the paper uh, that Nada and I wrote entitled The Road to Justice, Lessons for Ukraine from the USSR Invasion of Afghanistan came about. Um, so we hope that this paper can serve as a basis to delve into some very interesting discussions today. Um, Nader and I's paths crossed uh, last year, uh, not long after he'd moved to the Netherlands and after the announcement of the so-called special military operation by Russia in Ukraine, which was going to have real implications also for our Asser Institute project on Ukraine that Nader mentioned, which had been ongoing since 2020. Over Zoom from afar, uh, we had many conversations and uh, we realized that despite the many contextual differences uh, Ukraine and the USSR invasion of Afghanistan in the late 70s and 80s and the continuing insecurity there. There were in fact synergies, both in terms of the conduct occurring and also the responses to that conduct. So we began writing. But over the course of the year, uh, what we found most interesting as a point of comparison was not the first aspect, the legal classifications of specific types of conduct, but rather the second, the responses to the invasions and, and that conduct, both domestically and by the international community. Nader and I certainly do not think that comparison for the sake of comparison uh, is useful, but and these invasions are, are, are very uniquely complex and can be distinguished on many levels, including temporally, territorially, and in terms of the perpetrators and victims affected. However, we do believe that history can be instructive and that experiences are best shared. And so in this paper, we ask ourselves, what can we learn from the USSR invasion of Afghanistan and the development since for the implementation of transitional justice in Ukraine? And at this event, given that we are joined by some incredible speakers, I'm also curious to find out how the situation in Ukraine and the, the movements made in terms of justice and accountability there could be relevant to those working in the context of Afghanistan. 
In my view, to promote the international rule of law, we should share and learn from experiences at both ends. Um, so on that note, I want to thank everyone uh, that has helped to organize this event, and I'm really looking forward to the discussions today. Yeah, thanks a lot, Victoria, for your excellent introduction of your paper. Um, perhaps this is a good moment to uh, start off uh, with your co-author, uh, Nada Nadiri, um, with an additional que question. Um, so, Nada, you obviously have quite, you know, from the bio I just read out, it's, it's pretty obvious that you have a lot of um, impressive first-hand experience dealing with uh, peace and justice in Afghanistan. So I'd like you, I would like to ask you, what are, in your view, at the moment, uh, the main obstacles that continue to block the road to justice um, in Afghanistan? And, and why do you think it's so essential um, to end this impunity for the many serious crimes of international humanitarian law um, that were committed in Afghanistan in past de decades? Good morning, Tarek, and uh, everybody. Uh, great to see uh, Richard and, and uh, other friends and uh, Dr. Demetrio and others uh, on this panel. Um, Tarek, the, the question of peace and justice uh, and obstacle is not unique only to Afghanistan, but Afghanistan certainly presents a very clear example uh, and unique one uh, taking uh, the, the former Soviet Union's uh, involvement and some of those legacies that are currently being carried out by the Russia today uh, and the, the, the parallels and patterns of uh, 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 behaviors of the forces then and now. So peace building measures often, uh, I see it, uh, focuses on immediate conflict resolution issues uh, and therefore inadvertently uh, bypassing the challenging path toward uh, uh, addressing the past atrocities. Uh, this approach we do see in many places while aiming for short-term peace, which the guns need to be silent, violence need to be ended, but it frequently falls short in delivering sustainable outcomes and peace uh, in that sense for the victims and for the families and for the societies uh, uh, is, is not the way that they, they were expecting. Uh, so Afghanistan is uh, one unique case, but there are others also uh, that lessons could be, could be learned uh, in this regard. The legacy of injustices and sustained impunity that we have starting from the Soviet invasion uh, of the country, followed by the civil war, and then the Taliban first uh, version, and then uh, the two uh, decades of uh, 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 additional violence for the international community and the Afghan forces and the Taliban. And it continues uh, uh, to date. Uh, uh, could be a very important example that lesson could be drawn from it. So few quick points. Uh, one, when we see after the Soviet Union collapsed uh, and the Cold War ended, the world forgot about the fact that there was one million lives lost as a result of indiscriminate bombardment of the villages uh, by the Soviet Union forces and their military operation and the regime backed by them. Uh, and therefore, they walked away with it and uh, the demand for justice was unaddressed. The United States, Russia, Pakistan, uh, and then Afghan government signed a so-called peace accord, uh, the Geneva 19. 88, uh, uh, and that also uh, failed to address uh, the collective suffering of Afghans uh, from the atrocities they gone through. Uh, similarly, uh, following the Bonn Conference, the political order that in 2001 was put in place, the Afghan leaders, political leaders and international community also once again talk of short-term goals. Uh, and they consciously avoided uh, 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 confronting the painful legacy of the past abuses uh, once again. Uh, so instead of collaborating, instead of that to uh, take side of the victims, they start collaborating by some of the abusers of the, uh, of the civil war uh, of the 1990s. Uh, and the consequences was the country was continued to go to the path of instability, publics lose of trust of the, of the institutions. Uh, the second point, uh, the public throughout 
uh, these processes. So very reported one through the national consultation that the Afghan Independent Human Rights Commission at the time carried out, and then uh, a result of it, a call for justice. Richard was involved uh, also off, off the world and through that. Um, and since 2000, uh, since 1980s, people demanded, and they remain consistent that uh, justice need to be delivered. Uh, they recognized addressing the past injustices as a pivotal uh, uh, a, a element in achieving lasting peace and stability. Uh, but tragically, uh, uh, that that was uh, 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 denied. Uh, 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 although seventy six percent of those uh, talk to the commission at that time believe firmly that just dealing with the past atrocities will lead to uh, uh, stability. Now, uh, the, 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 probably the last point: the crimes that are committed by the uh, Soviet during their decade long. Uh, invasion of Afghanistan, as well as the abuses uh, by the Afghan and international forces after December 2001 remained unaddressed. And how that then uh, can uh, help in prevailing culture of impunity, provided the Taliban uh, to use it as an effective tool and other terrorist groups um, uh, against uh, um, both the international community and the Afghan population, and to, they try to seek credibility, despite the fact that they were on daily basis carrying out and continues to carry out unforgivable, unforgivable crimes and atrocities. So why Afghanistan and Ukraine? And as uh, Victoria uh, uh, explained that in our paper, the aim is that do not forget about the essential part uh, of peace building. Uh, as we go, the war rages on a daily basis. Uh, uh, civilians are being harmed and lives, you know, some lives are being taken. But the, at the end, uh, uh, it shouldn't be let's push peace uh, uh, for later, uh, justice for the later stage and, and deal with the peace. And therefore, uh, while it's uh, uh, encouraging to see a lot of initiatives in preparing the ground uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, for, for future justices, documentations are happening, civil society is involved, the government is uh, uh, dealing with it. But in my personal experience, uh, the sense of pragmatism in uh, uh, pursuing a peace path always pushes the demand for justice. And, and both politicians and practitioners in peace building would then argue, this is not time for dealing with the, with the atrocities. Russia is powerful, you can't deal with them on the justice issues, now let's get the peace done. And this sense of pragmatism and a practical agreement, uh, path to agreement on peace would then undermine uh, uh, the demand for justice. And it will set a very wrong mm -hmm. precedent uh, uh, internationally, uh, uh, but also for the victims in U Ukraine itself, that the disillusionment uh, will remain and that trauma of it will, will continue. And therefore it's time, to think creatively, both coordinating, as we say in the paper, coordinating all the documentation effort, but also the advocacy effort, but also to come cr with creative mechanisms that how those pragmatist politicians and peacemakers on the table when they discuss peace cannot forget about adding elements and that opens the path for justice and accountability uh, in the long term. I'll stop there, I exhausted more than five minutes, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Nada. Just about uh, five minutes. Uh, so, if I have, this is a good moment to bring in uh, Richard into discussion. Um, so, yeah, since, since the work of the Commission, there have been quite a few uh, political and uh, uh, generally uh, arms conflict developments in Afghanistan. Uh, so, could you sketch uh, perhaps some of the key challenges and circumstances on the ground at the moment in Afghanistan that keep continuing to block the road to justice? and and perhaps would you also have any suggestions how we can successfully um, break those seemingly endless cycles of violence in Afghanistan and in, in effectively any part of the world? Over to you, Richard. Okay. Um, thank you very much, um, Tariq, and, and thank you to you and to the ASA Institute um, for inviting me on, on this um, esteemed panel. Um, and thank you to Victoria and Nade for your paper. Nade shared it with me some time ago. Um, and until reading this paper, 
I hadn't given much thought to the comparison between the Afghan and the Ukraine context um, when it comes to issues of peace and of, of justice. So it's been stimulating for me uh, to be able to reflect on, 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 on it. Uh, and as uh, Nada has kind of inferred already, um, we've, uh, we've known each other for 20 years and, and we actually began working together at, uh, 20 years ago at the Afghan Independent Human Rights Commission. And back then we're thinking about these issues. And one of the things that, uh, that, I, that I recall from that period of 2003 um, was a sense from Nada and his colleagues both in the commission and in the civil society, that time was running short, that an opportunity had been created for uh, justice in Afghanistan um, after 2001. And we haven't mentioned 9-11. I, I do think, you know, we, we should acknowledge how pivotal 9-11 was on, for Afghanistan. But the, the opportunity that could have been created at that point wasn't taken. And there was perhaps a, a short period where there was a chance of uh, peace with justice, um, uh, but it wasn't the Taliban that filled the gap very quickly. It was the warlords uh, who jumped in uh, within months. Um, and those, uh, those on the human rights side, including Nader and his colleagues at the Human Rights Commission, were at, even at that point extremely anxious that time was running short and that the, the door would shut or the window would close. Uh, so I recall that well. And I do think that as the paper indicates, um, both uh, Ukraine uh, now and the, the uh, Soviet uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan um, in 89 uh, were pivotal moments in the world order. One more or less signaled the end of the Soviet Union. I mean, there are other elements as well, but it was significant. Uh, and now with Ukraine, well, we don't know what, but it is clearly um, uh, something that is extremely, extremely pivotal. One of the things that strikes me uh, from the paper um, uh, is the importance of a victim-centered approach or a survivor-centered approach. Um, and Nade uh, referred to the call for justice paper. That was, uh, it, it's, you know, it's kind of old now, but it's, it stood the test of time. Uh, it was a very good study. And as he's uh, mentioned, 76% of the respondents um, prioritized justice. And there is always this uh, concern in peacemaking for a kind of a, a quick, uh, uh, a piece, um, but the question is that without justice, um, can it uh, it be sustainable? I think there was a missed opportunity, and perhaps there was another missed opportunity a few years later, um, because as I mentioned, there there was an action plan uh, for um, a transit had a long name, but I'll call it transitional justice in uh, Afghanistan that was. Um, was launched and supported by President Karzai in 2006. Um, it was torpedoed for a number of reasons, um, but I think uh, the biggest one um, was the passing of an amnesty law um, by a parliament that was dominated by the warlords. Um, I hope I'm not, you know, if Nada, if you disagree with me, let me know, but I think that was a big. A, a big blow. Uh, I think the lack of political will on the government side, but also on the international community side was another blow. And also I think it, it, the, it happened that the, those, the perpetrators got a bit scared. Um, they saw that there was a, um, a, a momentum building from the human rights side. Um, and, uh, you know, when reports came out, uh, you know, with titles like Blood on Their Hands, which I remember, um, that actually scared them. And it was actually against Nadia's advice um, because 
rather than engaging, they, they, they blocked and they had the political power to do so. Now, but coming, you know, fast forwarding another 20 years almost, um, uh, well, that's 17 years, um, I think we need to make sure, and I have a responsibility now as the, as the UN Special Rapporteur to, to try and make sure that the mistakes of the past are not repeated. And um, uh, I, maybe I, I, I just like to kind of map out where, uh, before I finish, where, um, uh, where accountability mechanisms stand now in Afghanistan. Um, and what is the political will? I'll do this, just do this very quickly. Throughout the time, there has been a UN mission in Afghanistan, a UN a Security Council mandated um, political mission, um, which has a human rights mandate and a human rights component. It's most significant, the biggest com component, but there is no counterpart on the Afghan side anymore, no national human rights institution. Until Taliban takeover, there was a counterpart. And, and uh, now it's, it's really um, on the UN and on a pretty very um, under pressure Afghan civil society uh, in, in the country. So there, that still exists. On the outside, the ICC, uh, which has had Afghanistan on its books for more than 10 years, has finally started a serious investigation, only since last year in October. And I know there has been enormous frustration, perhaps there still is, that the ICC has not moved on a flagrant, egregious human rights violations and, 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 and apparent um, uh, international crimes committed in Afghanistan, not contributing to, to the challenge to impunity. But it does seem now that they are uh, getting serious. I've met with them several times. Um, they do now uh, have a plan uh, and they have a quite a significant team that is uh, working on investigation and prosecution um, of on Afghanistan. So uh, that is uh, that I think is a change um, and I uh, am hopeful that it will lead to something. Um, there is also the mandate that I hold um, and which was established uh, in the wake of the Taliban takeover in October 21. Um, I am a special rapporteur, but uh, I uh, also have a, a fact-finding um, uh, expectation. So um, I am both expected to engage, to write reports on the situation, to make recommendations for improvements, but at the same time, I'm also um, asked to um, uh, document and preserve um, uh, uh, instances of um, uh, violations and abuses of human rights in Afghanistan. Um, so it's uh, a, a, a little bit of a halfway house between, for those who are familiar with the UN system, between a special procedure and a commission of inquiry or fact-finding um, mission. Um, I'll just finish up on um, really um, kind of what are the gaps uh, and what is the, the chance, what are the chances moving forward? Um, I'm, an, I'm in Geneva now, as uh, uh, Tariq mentioned, um, for a, a session of the Human Rights Council, I made uh, a, actually a joint report um, with the Working Group on Discrimination Against Women and Girls on the situation of women and girls uh, earlier this week. Um, we have, uh, I uh, we, we have recommended, and I have recommended in the past, further inquiries. Um, in this case, we raised the issues of gender persecution and of the um, uh, uh, possibility of gender apartheid. Gender apartheid doesn't actually exist in international law. Apartheid exists um, uh, on the ground of race, um, but we were struck that uh, if one applies the criteria for uh, racial, for apartheid on race to Afghanistan and replace the place race with gender, um, it appears to neatly fit the definition. So we have, um, uh, uh, we concluded that it gives rise to serious concern uh, regarding the treatment of women and girls and in no other country are they treated as badly and in no other country are, are uh, girls above uh, sixth grade banned from education.
um, we've uh, uh, recommended a, a, a UN report um, on that matter. But with my own mandate, there's also um, a, a, I think, a interest in expanding the mandate and uh, perhaps looking at something else on Afghanistan. And I, I don't oppose that. I think it's a good idea. I think it's needed. But I also think it raises questions of jurisdiction, which goes back to the short and long term. Um, when I talk to member states and even to some NGOs, um, they are thinking about uh, uh, increasing the accountability mechanisms on the Taliban and possibly on uh, Islamic State's uh, activity in Afghanistan, and only looking uh, from um, August 2021. Now, I, that troubles me uh, because I'm in, in my mandate invited, I'm actually required to take a survivor-centered approach. So how can I, as special rapporteur, um, approach the survivors and say, well, if, if the abuse that affected, uh, the violation that uh, made you and your family victims um, occurred before August 21, um, you will not get justice. Uh, there will be no path to justice. But if uh, it occurred after 2021 in August, you may get justice. Now, that seems to me to be uh, contrary to uh, principle, not only uh, in international um, uh, human rights principles and, and um, transitional justice, but also, as Nada has pointed out, uh, to the, um, the pursuance of longer term, durable peace with justice. And of course, politically, one of the reasons why they want to put this cutoff date is if you go back before August 2021, you start looking at the uh, responsibility of other parties to the conflict, um, including the Republic, including the international forces that were in Afghanistan. And politically, there, that, there is, uh, that is contested. Um, there's an appetite by some and not an appetite by others, and it becomes a geopolitical issue. I've exceeded my six or seven minutes. So I'll stop there, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Richard, and, and no worries about uh, your time. Uh, very interesting to hear all your all these insights from from the mandate and all the important work that you've been uh, you've been doing in Afghanistan. Um, so perhaps you I mean you and, and Nada already um, explored some of the synergy between Afghanistan and Ukraine, which is great. Uh, in the spirit of, of you know Nada and Victoria's paper, it would be good to draw in now uh, Dmitro Kovalt into the discussion, um, who is an expert from Ukraine. On trans transitional justice. So, Dimitro, maybe you could, could you, uh, perhaps for us to um, to describe a bit the the steps that were taken about uh, transition in terms of transitional justice um, from the outbreak of the armed conflict in Ukraine in 2014. So, not just from uh, a year ago, but but also from back in the day in 2014. Uh, thank you, uh, Tariq, very much for giving me a floor. Let me start uh, from couple of compliments that I can't but uh, make after reading the, the article. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, reflect on uh, what is uh, mentioned in the article with regards to justice uh, everywhere. I think it's uh, this idea is usually mentioned uh, as a, a quote of uh, Martin Luther King Jr., who basically said that there is no such thing as ju justice somewhere. Uh, there is the justice should be indeed global, and only if if it is uh, global uh, we can uh, speak about uh, justice and uh, um, uh, think that uh, we uh, will achieve it. Uh, so this idea, this one of the core ideas of the article is very important for Ukraine right now, because what we see uh, in Ukraine is that a uh, certain portion of states, uh, they uh, look at Ukrainian crisis and the war in Ukraine and the uh, atrocities that are being committed in Ukraine as just um, examples of other unaddressed atrocities that happened before that in different parts of the world. And for that reason, they do not see why it's so important to address the atrocities with a special mechanism, for instance, like uh, the aggression tribunal or other international bodies that would investigate, document, and then maybe adjudicate even cases deriving from Ukraine. So um, 
the the problem uh, with uh, the problems with justice before 2022 create this uh, unbalanced in a way approach to the Ukrainian war from uh, different countries and uh, um, here the global south of course um, means quite a lot because they uh, suffered the most from the uh, injustices, from the uh, impunity, and from the inattention of uh, world institutions and uh, other states to the atrocities that were committed in there. So uh, indeed, this idea of justice everywhere is uh, very uh, important for Ukraine right now. Another uh, complement would uh, go for uh, the imperial prism that is taken uh, in the article, and I really appreciate that the article mentioned that the, the war in Ukraine uh, should be evaluated approach uh, with this uh, idea that it's a, a, newly, a new imperial war um, that uh, was started by the Russian Federation against its former colony. Uh, this prism is indeed really very important and it uh, shows, uh, it uh, gives uh, the, the taste of this conflict and uh, allows to, um, uh, to understand uh, its causes um, better. And then um, I will turn to the idea that uh, peace without justice uh, doesn't uh, really work. And especially if taken in the long run, and uh, uh, Afghanistan is a good, very good example of that. Uh, some time ago, I think it was um, half a year ago, or something like that, uh, I was invited to talk uh, on the panel uh, that uh, combined experts uh, documenting war crimes committed by the Russian uh, armed forces in Chechnya, then in uh, Moldova, then in Georgia and Syria. Uh, and the uh, overall idea of the premise of that discussion was that uh, if uh, uh, international crimes uh, are, uh, are being unpunished, uh, that leads to the uh, to the further atrocities in uh, different regions uh, and uh, in different countries. Uh, but uh, um, after reading the article, I realized that it's not only about the uh, 90s and uh, 90s uh, of uh, 20th century and 21st century when these atrocities were not uh, addressed actually. Uh, we can uh, mention uh, the atrocities of uh, Stalin regime in the USSR that were never uh, fully recognized by the uh, Russian Federation and never uh, fully uh, addressed uh, on the state level, on the legislative level, neither by Russia nor by other states. Then we have the crimes that were committed uh, by the Soviet forces uh, in the course of the Second World War. We usually speak about Nazi crimes for obvious re uh, reasons, but there were uh, lots of um, uh, Soviet crimes that uh, were a taboo for many researchers and especially for politicians to even mention about. And then Afghanistan, of course, uh, the, the crimes that were committed there and were, were described um, briefly in the article we are discussing today uh, were enormous and uh, um, they were, again, uh, out of uh, interest uh, in Russia, especially, but also in many other places in the world. So indeed, this impunity circle, it, it uh, was not uh, um, founded or it was not um, started in 90s, uh, its origins go uh, much further. And uh, um, indeed, to achieve peace, sustainable peace, we need to carry about justice as quickly as possible, as uh, early as possible. And uh, now let me turn to indeed transitional justice uh, project uh, projects in Ukraine since 2014, because as uh, Yuturik uh, rightly uh, noticed, uh, the uh, conflict, the armed conflict in Ukraine and the aggression against Ukraine uh, didn't start in 2022. It started much earlier with the occupation of Crimea and then with the uh, proxy war uh, that was initiated by the Russian Federation in the eastern part of Ukraine in 2014. Um, so since 2014, uh, there were a couple of projects aiming at uh, uh, creating a kind of roadmap and um, uh, detailed legislation on how Ukraine should reintegrate peacefully uh, territories that uh, were under the occupation of the Russian Federation. This roadmap and uh, legislation, uh, draft legislation, 
it basically, it followed the uh, existing and well-known concepts of transitional justice that were discussed for decades in theory, but also applied and practice in different uh, contexts, like the Bosnian context, Colombian context, and many others. So uh, both the roadmap and the legislation, uh, they uh, reflected on the convalidation of documents, on the right for truth, on the um, amnesties, on the responsibility uh, for some um, uh, higher political leaders, uh, on the illustration and uh, other aspects uh, of uh, transitional justice. Uh, but uh, the... Um, kind of um, uh, basic idea of these transitional justice uh, projects was that uh, to reintegrate uh, territories peacefully, Ukraine has to make maybe not concessions, but at least steps forward, steps towards uh, the societies on the occupied territories. And uh, uh, frankly, my feeling and the feeling of uh, many other uh, human rights defenders and uh, legal professionals was that uh, Ukraine was ready. Of course, it, it uh, didn't come uh, easy, but still Ukraine was ready to um, make these steps towards uh, the uh, people on the occupied territories. But uh, this uh, dramatically changed after 2022. For the obvious reason, uh, the concessions, any concessions actually, that uh, endanger uh, the uh, security and endanger the statehood uh, of Ukraine uh, became impossible and unacceptable for a majority of the Ukrainian population, both uh, the, the population that lived on the unoccupied territories and those who uh, relocated from the newly occupied territories. So since 2022, at least for half a year, the whole discussion about transitional justice just stopped. So there were no initiatives, no new um, uh, comments or uh, public uh, discussions uh, regarding transitional justice. But now we see the revitalization of these uh, uh, talks. And we see that uh, now uh, transitional justice returns to uh, the official uh, vocabulary of Ukrainian politicians, but also to the vocabulary of human rights defenders. But transitional justice now means uh, maybe not a completely different thing, but still a different thing than it was uh, until uh, 2022. So now transitional justice is mostly about making peace with ourselves, how we as uh, Ukrainian population, Ukrainian citizens should live further after the, um, uh, uh, after the, the war that uh, uh, was full of um, war crimes and other international crimes. So now transitional justice discussion is more about truth-telling, documenting of uh, mass atrocities and uh, the uh, coexistence with those who uh, collaborated with the Russian Federation during the uh, occupation uh, on the uh, during the occupation of uh, certain uh, regions of Ukraine. So transitional justice now is more about these things. And apart from that, it's largely about the responsibility for mass atrocities. Um, despite aggression hasn't started uh, in 2022, it was committed basically in 2014 with the occupation of first portion of Ukrainian land. Um, the uh, demand from Ukrainian society and also from politicians was not about uh, is, was not to um, prosecute the crime of aggression um, uh, in, 2000, in 2014. But in 2022 it became the integral part of any um, any uh, public position at least of Ukraine regarding accountability. Now it's always about crime of aggression as a um, enabling crime, as Nuremberg Tribunal put it. So indeed, uh, aggression enabled many other crimes of the uh, Russian Federation in Ukraine. And that's why it should be addressed either through the special tribunal, special international tribunal, or through other means like the national jurisdiction that is still able to prosecute some of the um, perpetrators of the crime of aggression. So uh, I will stop probably here because we will still have a uh, discussion afterwards. And that's how I see uh, the current situation with the transitional justice discourse in Ukraine. Thank you so much, uh, Dmitry, for bringing the uh, perspective from Ukraine uh, on the ground. Um, 
Victoria, um, I was wondering um, whether you could describe how the uh, February 2022 invasion has kind of changed the contours of the discourse um, in the Ukraine and how does the picture uh, different now from um, after the 2014 uh, invasion? Yeah, sure. Well, I first want to thank all the speakers for their observations and reflections on our paper. Um, I think they're hugely helpful and I'm thinking a lot now myself about how to move forward. So I think it's probably maybe helpful if I think about how we can apply some of these observations in Ukraine now. Um, so the first observation that I would make is that I think that now in Ukraine, there is a certain degree of fragmentation in terms of the initiatives uh, for justice. So rather than a transitional, uh, a holistic transitional justice framework, there are certain priorities. And I think Dimitro's already outlined some of these. So linking back to what Nader uh, mentioned at the beginning um, with regards to impunity for IHL and ICL violations in the Afghanistan context, we can say for certain that huge efforts are being made towards mobilizing criminal justice mechanisms domestically and internationally to prosecute international crimes in Ukraine. And I think while there are still valid concerns about the enforceability, for example, of the ICC arrest warrants or in absentia trials in Ukraine, there is at least concerted efforts and political will towards criminal justice um, in the context of Ukraine. This, of course, does spark some concerns as to double standards, and I think some of those have been mentioned already. So I do think it's interesting to consider how the mobilization of criminal justice mechanisms in the Ukraine context will or will not be a catalyst for other situations going forward. And then separately, we have also somewhat of a drive in the context of reparations now. So certain Ukrainian actors are working to provide urgent interim reparative measures for conflict related sexual violence survivors, for example, there are some movements towards um, securing compensation for property damage, there's legislation on this and there's also now the DIA app um, in Ukraine and recently, uh, as you may have seen, an agreement has been made by the Council of Europe and other states together with Ukraine to establish a register of damages and a future compensation mechanism in The Hague. So there's all these initiatives, but in my view, they're not sufficiently coordinated, uh, both in Ukraine and between international partners. Um, so I, I ask myself, is there a strategic reason for this? Is, is there a reason to consider them as separate initiatives rather than under a kind of an umbrella of justice or transitional justice? Is it because the conflict's still ongoing? Uh, is it issues of capacity or lack of coordination or resources? Or is it because of a policy narrative that is being promoted uh, on an international political level? I think it's, it's sometimes quite difficult to discuss all this while in the midst of conflict. And the only thing I would say, and I think this has already been mentioned, is that without attention at this stage, there's also a risk, as we've seen, for example, in the context of Afghanistan, that certain issues might get lost over time. The second observation I would make is that transitional justice or any at least these these justice mechanisms which are being pursued individually should be led by the victim's interests um, and Richard has already mentioned this and I think this was considered uh, by the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission when it worked on a call for justice. Um, in my personal view there's still somewhat of a lack of engagement between national and international actors uh, with civil society and victim representatives, as well as victims directly um, in the development and the operationalization of these justice initiatives in Ukraine. And this should be the starting point rather than coming at a later stage. It's not to say that the efforts are, not, are, are in vain. Um, it's my understanding, and Dimitros also mentioned this, that the Ukrainian population does consider criminal justice a priority and aggression specifically. But the question I have is whether more um, can be done to ensure that all the processes are victim centers. And the third and final observation I would make is that some issues are still deserving of more attention in my view. Uh, examples include rehabilitation, um, truth, uh, truth telling and reconciliation. On the first issue, the feeling I get is that Ukrainian CSOs are doing excellent work in this area. But we have to remember that 
they have limited resources. And I think many view rehabilitation as a kind of longer term goal, but I think many victims need psychosocial support and other forms of assistance to rebuild their lives, and that should start now. On truth telling, Dimitris already mentioned that there is a huge amount of documentation and monitoring going on by a range of national and international actors. Some of this is within specific mandates, such as the UN Commission of Inquiry, but much is by CSOs, um, and they're considering their outlets. So whether it be submission to uh, criminal investigations or something else. In my view, we need to consider what other role this information can have. Can it assist more in truth telling or providing a comprehensive historical narrative? And thirdly and finally, reconciliation. And this is a very controversial issue in the context of Ukraine, which always sparks a lively debate at this stage. In a recent uh, study visit that I participated in in Geneva um, with Ukrainian governmental and civil society actors, it was very clear that reconciliation was not possible in their minds while the conflict was ongoing and without addressing the historical framing um, of the conflict, including the Soviet and imperialistic narratives, and also without significant societal and institutional change in Russia. So I do think it's really important that we are that we strive to understand these broader issues to identify what steps, if any, can be taken at this stage. Um, so I'll stop there and, and leave time for some discussions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Victoria, and, and thanks indeed to all four uh, panelists for your interventions and your answers to uh, these questions. Um, so based on these responses, I actually got quite a few uh, follow-up questions for you on, on some of the more overarching and, and cross-cutting issues. Uh, but I was wondering, Perhaps uh, you, you would like to provide any immediate reaction to anything that was raised by um, any of the co-panelists so far. So Nada, uh, Dimitro, Victoria, Richard, do you have any immediate reaction? Anything that that maybe uh, was raised by uh, Victoria and Dimitro uh, in the Ukrainian context that resonates also with you, Richard, and, and Nada in the, Afghan, in the Afghan context, or vice versa? So uh, this would be um, the moment to... Uh, Sure. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dimitri, Victoria, and Richard. Uh, uh, very, very uh, uh, insightful uh, uh, interventions on all of those uh, issues surrounding the paper and the, the, the very difficult and complex question that uh, everybody needs to deal, both in Ukraine and many other places in Afghanistan. So I'm, uh, I'm considering myself both an idealist and pragmatist, uh, and sometimes difficult to reconcile both of them. And in that sense, uh, what I see uh, is uh, uh, raising some flag of, of caution and, and some early warning, uh, probably. Uh, so while the documentation, is, as uh, both uh, Dimitri and Victoria say, it going on, the, the paving the ground in Ukraine is wonderful and it's a very encouraging news. Uh, my fear is that, uh, as we say in the paper also, uh, that the level of coordination and reputation uh, that creates more st uh, uh, stigma and, and trauma in uh, uh, the, the victims themselves being interviewed by multiple uh, 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 groups is, is one issue that needs to be addressed uh, further among civil society, UN and others that they are uh, making documentation. But also an important element of that is while you collect and preserve evidence early on, the issue of sustaining that exercise is always very important and critical, both preservation of it archiving uh, of, of an, uh, archiving of it and further assessment. There are peaks in donor interest that we see in many parts of the world. Uh, when the conflict happens, there is a level of high degree of interest uh, based on national interest of different donors, but also proximity of the, the heat from the conflict. So what happens, there's a peak of donation and aid and financial support for our activities. But then when you move to a different phase why there's lesser interest and attention, uh, uh, the bulk of focus in case of Ukraine at this time will be on reconstruction and the priorities will be so big and therefore sometime some of the very critical but not immediate uh, at the eyes of the uh, uh, government and leadership and policymakers and the donors. 
will be pushed aside and then you will be left with all these infrastructure and attended and sustainable so thinking of longer term engagement of, of, of funding for it will be uh, uh, essential the second uh, issue of uh, early warning uh, while the conflict is still is going on we don't know the, the outcome and therefore civil society and academia and those interested need to come with at least number of options policy options in in a given scenario so if there is a stalemate at the end of the day and then through which a negotiation could go uh, forward, there's more chance that you could have more leverage of a prepared, much more stronger uh, mechanism for justice to be negotiated uh, there. Uh, but also uh, that need to be pragmatically uh, uh, looked at that the fundamentals of justice are preserved and the framework for the future is, is essential. The second situation uh, uh, would be uh, a, a Russia defeated, uh, uh, which uh, uh, in their quest of both invasion, but also loses Crimea and others. And in that situation, would there be a change of uh, leadership in Russia? And will the rest of the Russians will uphold their constitution and go forward and then accept uh, that things were, uh, went wrong? And for that, of course, uh, an ambitious uh, transitional justice and, and justice and accountability could be expected. And what are the elements acceptable in the situation. You need to think uh, ahead of time and early discussions of creativity there. Or unfortunately, sometimes it happens, it's war, there is uh, 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 not a success and a defeat and then a forced uh, peace agreement. Uh, and what are the very creative mechanisms, even in that situation, that you would uh, preserve uh, uh, elements of accountability, not only through seeking and through uh, collection, which is important, but it uh, adds to a high degree of uh, uh, trauma because victims and the society as a whole, in case of Ukraine, have gone through all these atrocities, have seen them firsthand. And a one-sided truth seeking uh, will, will not be enough. It could be archive and memorial and all of that, but then the real accountability uh, uh, will, will leave people uh, uh, frustrated, traumatized, uh, uh, if, not, uh, if not happens the real accountability. Uh, it, it, uh, Victoria talked about reconciliation. Uh, certainly that will take a lot of time. People to people relation always requires to be maintained because you the enemy is not the other side of the people uh, 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 demonizing the entire uh, uh, population will then not serve for long lasting peace and therefore that sort of understanding and dividing separating uh, uh, between the two would always be helpful and early on outreach for reconciliation and people to people talk probably to be facilitated if not in the territory of the two countries but in a third neutral place would be helpful uh, if russia allows its citizens to participate uh, in people to people discussion already will be helpful uh, for for reconciliation to we'll stop there Yes, Richard. Yeah, I'm not sure what system we have, so I'm not sure if I should jump in. But anyway, I put my hand up. Um, you know that I, I, I mean, I really uh, um, value. I mean, all of your um, uh, contributions and interventions, um, and also Nade's response. And I think I wanted to make three points. Um, uh, perhaps one more uh, talking to all of you, but I think Dimitro comes to mind particularly is. What is the nature of transitional justice in both of these, um, these conflicts? Uh, because they're not classic transitional justice situations. And maybe these days, there are not many classic uh, transitional justice situations where transitional justice is about a transition from a, a conflict or repression to a democracy. Um, in the case of Ukraine, it's it's within the context of a conflict that there's an attempt at a transitional justice. And in the case of Afghanistan, it's uh, it's 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 topsy turvy. It's upside down. It's uh, not um, the emergence of a uh, of a country from conflict um, and repression to democracy, but the other way around. 
uh, it's uh, from um, a, a democracy to repression. Uh, so what, you know, how does transitional make justice make sense um, in that situation? And I, I was reflecting on this because I, uh, you know, I was wondering, well, can we even call it transitional justice? Um, what are we trying to, to achieve what, uh, now? And, and certainly, as Nade has mentioned, uh, documentation is kind of um, uh, the basis of it. Uh, I remember years ago, uh, it st sticks in my mind, um, someone saying uh, in a meeting I was in um, that uh, documentation and preservation is like money in the bank. You put the, in, the except the, the money is the information and you put it away and sometime it's going to be useful to bring about justice. And there is this tension, I think, and I understand it between those, the activists, and by definition, activists want to make change now and their frustration that change is not happening fast enough and um, uh, those that say we need to think long term and it's really difficult to look away and we shouldn't look away from the pain of today to think about the long term future but uh, in a way we need to do we need to do both that which brings me to my second my second point which is that the majority of this conversation is about accountability um, but I also um, want to introduce the concept of protection, um, because in I imagine in Ukraine and certainly now in Afghanistan, uh, we uh, what is needed is uh, certainly what is needed is accountability to challenge the climate of impunity that has existed for decades. Uh, but also Afghans need protection. Um, and they need their, the, the institutions that previously existed to protect them, a human rights commission, indeed a constitution, uh, a parliament, um, uh, uh, properly uh, constructed an, oper an operational uh, judiciary and, and uh, many other of the um, uh, mechanisms of governance that are necessary to uh, bring to have checks and balances on excesses of power have have uh, have disappeared. So it is essentially a totalitarian uh, state. Uh, so protection is also needed, and I wanted to kind of segue from that to the issue of persecution. Um, uh, we've touched on earlier, we can talk about. Um, I'm happy to discuss this. Um, the issue of gender persecution, which is something that I've uh, and my colleagues have written about um, recently. But there's also to compare Afghanistan and, and Ukraine, the issue of um, uh, the rights of those uh, uh, who are persecuted to seek asylum. And regularly, I'm approached by Afghans comparing the way in which they have been treated by third countries to Ukrainians. Now, uh, even today, uh, I was approached uh, after a side event in Geneva by someone who was very animated and, and upset uh, that a particular country um, has a much more open policy to accepting Ukrainian refugees than it does to Afghan refugees. And we shouldn't get into any competition around this. But I do think that um, we need to keep protection alongside accountability. Um, certainly in Afghanistan, I'm not really qualified to co comment on Ukraine, but I'd be interested in the views of others on that. Thank you. Mitra or um, Victoria, would you like to, to add something to that? Maybe really quickly, I would comment on uh, the reconciliation issue, and maybe then, uh, if we still have time, on the protection. Uh, so I uh, very much align with the idea that Victoria expressed uh, regarding the uh, reconciliation, uh, which will be 
become possible after uh, the decolonization and the change of uh, regime, uh, the, the change of this colonial perspective that Russia uh, tries to impose on other states and the change of, uh, of regime in Russia. Uh, before that, indeed, it's the majority view here in Ukraine that the real uh, reconciliation can be possible. And the reason for that, the reason for such a perspective is that uh, the Russian Federation um, is now kind of weaponizing the transitional justice discourse, and it is doing it for, for years now. So uh, um, that means that uh, uh, the Russian Federation uh, policies uh, um, try to um, create situation, situations in which um, states that are being basically oppressed and they are being uh, colonized uh, by the R Russian Federation, they uh, are um, uh, pressed to engage in uh, transitional justice uh, projects uh, that would uh, create uh, uh, rather advantages for further uh, Russian uh, colonization of these territories. And that's how most of the Ukrainian uh, human rights defenders, but also ordinary people see the discussion about reconciliation right now. So if we start the reconciliation, that would mean that uh, the uh, Russian Federation will sell the idea that it's not about uh, people, it's not about uh, war crimes, it's not about uh, um, uh, some differences in seen uh, history, it's only about some political battles that are being fought on the higher level between Russia, United States, and a bit of Ukraine, and that's it. So um, uh, that's uh, for, the, for, for very that reason, uh, the, there is certain skepticism about reconciliation right now uh, in Ukrainian society. Uh, it's not to say that reconciliation shouldn't happen. It, it should definitely. But I think that uh, we should first uh, reconcile inside Ukrainian uh, society because there are still many um, uh, issues around which uh, the conflicts uh, may arise. For instance, there is the issue whether you left the occupied territories or you stayed uh, during the occupation on that territory, whether you uh, left Ukraine or you stayed in Ukraine helping Ukrainian uh, militaries, for instance, or just being here and uh, fueling Ukrainian economy. Uh, whether you um, joined the armed forces or you uh, hasn't, uh, you, you haven't uh, done this, and you consider yourself as a rather like economic force than the uh, person who should join armed forces. So all these uh, um, conflicts will uh, still be present in Ukraine for, for years from now. That's why when I spoke about reconciliation, I flagged that it's uh, very important for Ukraine to, first of all, think about reconciliation inside Ukrainian society, and only after some years, after indeed uh, decolonization of Russian foreign policy and, uh, and change of the regime in Russia, we can speak about reconciliation with, uh, with uh, Russian Federation and with uh, Russian citizens. Um, and then uh, speaking about protection, uh, I think it's a very valid point that protection should uh, come along with uh, accountability. But uh, indeed, the situation in Ukraine and Afghanistan is quite different because in Ukraine, uh, who are living in Ukraine uh, are the uh, people, first of all, it's women and children, uh, women and children, uh, and uh, less so uh, men for many reasons, one of which is uh, the uh, internal restriction that we have for the uh, crossing of the border by men. And uh, indeed, we, we need protection for those who leave the country. Uh, but uh, those people are quite different from regular um, uh, refugees that we are seeing uh, when uh, the regime changed from democratic to anti-democratic, when we have this transition, as Richard put it, from uh, more democratic society to the authoritarian rule of uh, such an uh, yeah, political party or uh, religious movement or uh, other forms of uh, authoritarian uh, organizations. Uh, so uh, yes, uh, we should think about protection for sure, but we should also uh, see the differences between Ukraine and, and Afghanistan. Thank you. Maybe I could just also follow up with some very quick points. Um, so I'll maybe start also with the protection issue. Um, I think it's it's actually very interesting the way you phrase that, Richard, because 
the, the kind of word protection is not something I've thought about really in the Ukraine context. And I think it is really also for the reason that Dimitro mentions there, the difference between the Afghanistan context and the kind of totalitarian regime there and the situation in Ukraine. I think if we're thinking about people currently within Ukraine, obviously security and safety is still an issue. I think more in terms of protection, what I think of what comes to mind is more like what, what are the needs of people uh, in Ukraine? And that's medical system, that, that's housing, that's um, you know other aspects along those lines. That's what I'm thinking of when I think of protection. And then I agree, obviously there are you know refugees and people across the world and the issue of double standards is, is incredibly interesting there, I think. And that's not only in terms of um, asylum seekers and refugee, I think that that's also exactly what you mentioned that the ICC, for example, um, considering how long the investigation has been going on there. Although something that was very interesting to me and I heard recently um, was that, of course, we think that the ICC has moved very quickly on Ukraine. But again, we forget in saying that, that the conflict began in 2014. So we're almost at the 10 year mark there as well in terms of uh, the kind of opening of the investigation. So it's a very interesting issue and I think will we'll continue to be discussed. Um, but I'll stop there and, and leave some more time for discussion. Ada, feel free to uh, jump in. You are muted. On the ICC, um, while I'm, I'm very much in favor of ICC doing, uh, taking the lead and doing real work uh, uh, both on Ukraine and on Afghanistan, but my fear is uh, looking to the practicality and looking to the past experiences of how ICC engaged, it's a very lengthy process. It builds a lot of, a lot of hopes and expectation, but then the, the, the number of cases that it could handle is limited and the expectation of the population is way, way uh, uh, higher. Now, uh, for a situation like Ukraine, probably a special tribunal would suit much more like it was the ICTY or uh, ICTR, uh, something uh, 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 that, that will be dedicated full time while, of course, ICC is a full-time dedicated international body, and I'm very much in favor of them to carry out uh, much more. But then uh, probably either they set up a special procedure and uh, uh, dedicated uh, uh, resources to be tapped by others to carry out that, uh, a larger number of, of, of uh, uh, investigation and prosecution. Otherwise, it will take time and us while justice is not time bound and it can take whenever it takes and whenever the time is really to, to, to help people, to hold people accountable, but it does not help uh, the higher expectation that has already been built uh, by the announcement. And then uh, the court moves slowly, while carefully, but slowly to, uh, uh, to, to deliver. And sometimes being on the ground is much more helpful if a body carries out, out that kind of uh, process is on the ground and the victims and the families and the people see them operating. That uh, also helps this healing process for the victims. Uh, and on the question of protection, two points probably are, are important. Uh, first, uh, the protection is needed for the victims and especially for the eyewitnesses. Uh, and as, as those identification uh, is, uh, is happening uh, of those eyewitnesses, uh, their protection becomes also an essential part. So whatever document and data is collected, uh, taking all these cybersecurity issues uh, these days, uh, uh, the protection of those eyewitnesses are paramount and, and essential. Mostly that's not given much of attention uh, uh, um, once when ahead of the process. When the process begins, then everybody provides. But before that, while the names are known, the documentation is there, uh, uh, they need to be uh, uh, more, more safeguarding of those. And second, in relation to refugees, Afghans versus uh, uh, Ukrainians, nobody says and should not argue that Ukrainians should not be treated differently. They, they should. 
uh, they're escaping war, as, as, as most of us Afghans escaped war, escaped war in, in the past. But then that's the question of double standard. Uh, so if international law uh, uh, are, are applicable, uh, the, uh, the, the conventions uh, uh, are identifying if somebody escapes persecution to the level that exists today in Afghanistan of women entirely being wiped out of the society, uh, uh, civil society activists across the country. It's not one specific geography, the South, the North, the Central Afghanistan. Uh, so that's, that's also the, uh, 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 it, it's the issue of persecution, arbitrary killing, uh, extrajudicial killing continues. Uh, and and uh, countries need to also, yes, they are under immense burden uh, and, and pressure, and they, they take a lot of burden, but uh, uh, how they communicate, how they treat uh, is also a matter of, of, of principle and obligation under the international law. Yeah, thanks a lot, Nada. Uh, perhaps at this point, we could finally open up the floor for uh, questions from the audience. Um, I'm going to ask you to, to use the raise hand function in Zoom if you want to ask a question. And if you're not in a position to speak, um, that's also fine. You can just type your question in the chat and I'll um, read them out loud. Um, we have already two questions in the chat. So I see one raised hand from, apologies in advance for mispronouncing uh, your name. Uh, uh, Safi, if you'd like to take the floor. That's correct, yes. Thank you. So, sh should I go first, sir? Yes, feel free. Could you okay. please introduce yourself? Yes. Uh, so, my name is uh, Hajratullah Safi. I am a visiting researcher at the University of Duisburg Essen in Germany. And I was uh, a law lecturer at the law faculty of uh, Nangdahar University in Afghanistan for 10 years. And uh, now I'm working on a project of uh, 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 assessing and uh, uh, like uh, determining the legal status of the uh, amnesty law of Afghanistan uh, in the point of view of Sharia law and international law obligations of Afghanistan. So actually, I have two questions which are related to my research. So the first question is uh, for Richard Bent, uh, which is working a great job in Afghanistan and is uh, engaged in Afghanistan since last two decades, uh, according to my information. Uh, I have like I have many questions, but to to summarize all the questions, uh, how do you see the future of uh, transitional justice and near future in Afghanistan? Because there is a ministry law which is still in force. And if any, for example, any peace deal is uh, made, so it will be considered a still in force law. And we have like we had a transitional justice section plan, which has not been. Uh, uh, we, we don't have any achievement. It, it was expired in two thousand nine. So my question again is: uh, How do you see transitional justice in the near future in Afghanistan? And for. Uh, 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 Sir Nader Nadari, I also have a question that you are part of the uh, uh, delegation of the Republic government for talking with the Taliban in Doha. So uh, I haven't heard anything regarding uh, uh, anything on the agenda regarding transitional justice because the group that you were talking with was like there are many accusations and evidence that they have committed many violations of international humanitarian law and international human rights law. Had you, was there anything on the agenda that if progress is being made on the peace, you will also discuss the issue of transitional justice with the Taliban? These are my questions. Thank you so much for your uh, very, very important topic and in, in discussion today. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Safi, for your questions. Perhaps we can tackle these two questions first, and then we'll move through the two questions that I see in the chat. So now that Richard who wants to, uh, to start. Uh, you want to go first, Nada, or shall I? Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Um, I, I mean, uh, thank you, um, uh, Hijratullah, and, uh, and also for the feedback. 
Um, and I'm, I'm certainly interested in, in your studies and, and what conclusions you reach uh, regarding the amnesty law. Um, I do think, though, that at the moment, it's a little bit of, uh, if you forgive me, an academic question, uh, because at the moment, the, the, those in power have set aside the Constitution. Uh, it's actually unclear uh, what law does apply in yes. Afghanistan at the moment. And the only possibility for criminal accountability, for criminal, for, for, for justice, um, lies in the international sphere, either at the ICC uh, or universal jurisdiction, which we, we haven't really discussed much, but I think is um, uh, possibly uh, significant um, for Afghanistan. Uh, you know, given the state of the law and the state of the judiciary and the um, attitudes of the, um, the, the regime that's in power, um, the, the, the prospects of, uh, of justice are, uh, are, are remarkably small in Afghanistan. And I'm not even sure we would want um, uh, this group to even try. Uh, sometimes I'm asked, a, a kind of a different question, but I think it's the same answer, is uh, should they, uh, they, 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 they dissolve the uh, National Human Rights Institution that Nade used to be a member of, um, you know, would you like to see it uh, revived by the Taliban? And, you know, my answer is no, <laughs> because um, the whole ideology um, of the regime um, doesn't give any confidence uh, that it could be a credible institution. So I think there's an issue of credibility, but I don't want to discourage your studies because I think it will become important in the future. And I did just want to say in relation to something I was touching on before about uh, non-classic or, or, or non-traditional situations of transitional justice. I'm wondering more and more whether or not, rather than seeing the process from one state to another, that is, for example, from repressive, non-democratic to a more democratic yeah. regime, whether we shouldn't see them as circular. Um, uh, it's a bit unfortunate uh, that we might see them as circular, um, but I was discussing this with uh, someone who works in Latin America where transitional justice processes are, are, are decades old, and, and especially in some of the countries in Central America, um, the, the possibility of creating durable peace um, is so extremely hard that you might go around the circle a couple of times before you break the cycle. And we've talked about how to break the cycle of violence and impunity. Um, and I, I just you know throw this as an idea in there that maybe rather than linear, um, we do need to get to linear to break out of the circle, but it may be need, it may be necessary to go around once or twice um, before getting there. Um, long answer, sorry, and I'll thank you so much. Pass the floor back. Thank you. Well, uh, and thank you, Mr. Safi. Uh, quickly on the on the amnesty law, uh, the amnesty law was not ratified because of the public reaction, the Human Rights Commissions and the civil society in the general public was not enacted by, it was not signed by President Karzai. And then the procedure required the parliament to re-vote uh, on it. However, it was considered as an approved and adopted parliamentarian law. No court have ever used it except only one verdict based on that law in a district court uh, uh, in, in, the, uh, in a province, in Port province. Uh, so it did not uh, actually came into practice and was not enforced either. And procedurally, it, it could be challenged as a law. But as Richard said, the Taliban have thrown all the bodies of the laws that have been built in the past 20 years and even before, except very few uh, laws that they refer on, on uh, procedural issues.
Uh, so uh, I agree that universal jurisdiction uh, uh, will be one way. There are some efforts by Colony uh, Justice Foundation, uh, for example, that they seek both in uh, countries with universal jurisdiction and in Germany, uh, Germany, they approach Germany and a number of other places uh, that they are seeking. Uh, so that element is there. The ICC uh, begin, uh, but I hope it does not only limit itself to uh, the ISK, but they, they could look at the atrocities of the Taliban today and the 20 years and beyond, but also uh, uh, some of the abuses that happened by our forces and international forces then, so look for justice not to be selective in, in that sense. On the question of raising transitional justice with the Taliban in the peace negotiation, um, it was part of our agenda, the, the items that we have presented, uh, uh, the 10 items as an agenda, transitional justice was one of it uh, uh, there. However, we did not get to discuss that because of lack of interest uh, from Taliban to discuss anything. Uh, uh, as, as we say time and again, they were delaying time. There was no substantial discussion that they would have had interest in, in it. For them, it was a uh, it was it was a divergent rather than a meaningful uh, uh, process. I'm, I'm uh, doing uh, I'm working now on a detailed re uh, report of uh, what really happened in those uh, 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 time period. Uh, so hopefully, uh, once that's done as part of the book, uh, it will come out uh, uh, with the details. Thank you. Yeah. Good luck to you. Thank you. I hope that answers your your questions, Mr. Safi. Um, yeah. There are no further questions from the floor. I don't see any raised hand, but uh, there are two questions in the chat. Uh, so that one of them is uh, folks more on Ukraine, the other more on, on Afghanistan. The first one is um, by Mr. Victor Yatsina. Uh, the main difference between the war in Afghanistan waged by the USSR and the current military aggression of the Russian Federation towards Ukraine is, in my opinion, the fact that the Russian Federation is now fighting for territories, which is confirmed by the annexation of Crimea and the eastern regions of Ukraine, which, according to international law, belong to Ukraine. In this regard, the question arises as to whether, in the current history of the war between the Russian Federation and Ukraine, a more adequate example of justice is the Nuremberg or Tokyo trials. And the second question is posed by my colleague, Christoph Paulusen, um, who writes, first of all, many thanks to all the presenters for their insights. Um, on gender persecution, the point mentioned by Mr. Bennett, I have two questions from our ASA intern, Sri Lata Yaraman, who unfortunately cannot be here today, um, but is, who is following Mr. Bennett's important work in Afghanistan very closely. Uh, do you think that the lack of understanding of the dimensions of gender apartheid is what has impeded the international community from recognizing it as a crime or something beyond that? And in your opinion, what are the alternatives uh, to amending the Rome Statute for securing recognition and accountability for gender apartheid? Anyone who would like to uh, to go first? Maybe I can take the first question. Yes, uh, and leave uh, the second one to to my colleagues. Uh, indeed, in terms of uh, the model of justice that uh, will be used. Uh, or in Ukraine to create either a special tribunal or special institution dealing with international crimes uh, that were committed in Ukraine. Uh, the Nuremberg or Tokyo trials are much better, much closer example or much closer um, uh, experience that from which Ukraine may uh, take uh, some um, uh, advices. Uh, but uh, Afghanistan is uh, still a relevant example in many other ways. Uh, as it is explicitly mentioned in the article, for instance, uh, that we are discussing, uh, Afghanistan was a fight uh, for the zone of influence. Uh, so it's similar to Ukraine in a way. Of course, uh, the USSR then uh, didn't want to conquer uh, Afghanistan and uh, make it uh, its own territory, unlike Russia is doing uh, right now in Ukraine. But still, there was this idea of zones influence and uh, the zones that should be controlled ideologically, politically, economically uh, by uh, the USSR. And in this way, Afghanistan is similar to Ukraine. Uh, 
Uh, but also Afghanistan uh, is similar to Ukraine uh, in terms of uh, this momentum for justice that was also discussed in the article, because indeed uh, it doesn't, uh, um, uh, it uh, uh, has this uh, exp uh, its expiration uh, day, this momentum during which you can uh, really um, implement such initiatives to achieve justice, to, to build the institution, to think truths, etc. And I think it was a very important point made by the authors, by Victoria and Nader in the article that uh, Ukraine should learn from Afghan experience that if you do not do things now, if you do not pursue justice now, you will have definitely problems in uh, achieving it uh, in the future and not only justice, but also peace. Uh, so uh, that's a, a very uh, important lesson that we can take from the Afghan uh, experience. So despite, uh, architecturally speaking, justice model will definitely be more like Nuremberg or Tokyo in Ukraine, there are still many other things that we can learn from, from um, Afghan experience. Victoria, would you like to, to add anything to that? To be honest, no. I think Dimitro's uh, covered everything that I would mention there, so I'll, I'll allow time for the last question. And so perhaps, uh, Richard, you could, um, if you would like to have a go at uh, Srilata's uh, question, but also Nada, feel free, of course, to um, to add anything to Richard's contribution. Sure. Um, thanks, Tariq. Tariq, and thanks to Srilata for her question. Uh, maybe I just, you know, before coming to the direct answer, I just kind of briefly uh, uh, define the distinction between gender persecution and gender apartheid. Um, there's, they, they are uh, separate concepts. Uh, gender persecution is already in a crime in the Rome Statute. Um, it's a crime. It's an international crime. Uh, it's been there for twenty years. It's only being prosecuted twice, both times in Mali, and we are uh, we're still waiting the outcome of those cases. That says something, actually, given the treatment of women and girls throughout the world. Why has it taken 20 years to even use a, a crime that is on the books um, uh, of the International Criminal Court? But just to define it, um, persecution under uh, Article 7.2G of the Rome Statute is the intentional and severe deprivation of fundamental rights contrary to international law by reason of the identity of the group. Or collectivity. And uh, in my view, and that of my colleagues who wrote uh, the recent report, uh, while we, we're not in a position to make a final determination, we don't have that authority, but we believe the situation in Afghanistan gives, gives rise to critical concern that women and girls are being targeted for gender persecution because of their sex characteristics and because of the social constructs and criteria used to define gender roles, behavior, activities and attributes in Afghanistan under the Taliban regime. Uh, now, gender apartheid, different matter. Um, there is um, apartheid is uh, defined in, in the Rome Statute, but only on the ground of race. Uh, but what uh, 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 there has been a, a movement uh, among civil society since 1999 to characterize the situation of women and girls under the Taliban rule as a form of apartheid, gender apartheid. And if you look at uh, uh, what we call apartheid framing, it's understood as inhumane acts committed in the context of an institutionalized regime of systematic oppression and domination by one, and let's put in brackets, gender group uh, against another gender group or groups committed with the intention of maintaining that regime. Now, I think the question that um, uh, Srilata asked is, uh, do you think that there's a, a lack of understanding of the dimension that's impeded recognition of it? I do think it's partly a lack of understanding of the dimension of gender apartheid, but I really come back to part of my response to the first question, which is kind of why is it that only after 20 years, gender persecution, uh, which has been an international crime, is only now being addressed? 
by the uh, uh, by the, in the ICC. I think the same kind of answer comes to apartheid. No one, you know, because apartheid was was conceived in the context of South Africa um, decades ago. Um, it had been conceived only on the grounds of race. And it speaks something about the way in which different forms of, of discrimination against different categories are taken seriously or not, that it is still not applicable on the grounds of gender. But that, so I think it's a kind of, um, um, kind of inbuilt sexism that's uh, involved here. Um, and I do think there is a chance of moving towards it. And I noted that um, uh, the, the, the widow of, um, of Nelson Mandela, Gracia Michelle, uh, spoke out about the situation in Afghanistan as being gender apartheid recently. Um, and a number of member states, including actually South Africa, uh, in the Human Rights Council earlier this week, when we delivered our report, also referred to gender apartheid, gender persecution. So I, in, there isn't time to map out the path towards uh, the um, uh, making this a law here now, but um, uh, I hope that to some degree I've answered uh, Sri Lata's question, her first question. Uh, th Tarek, I, I fully agree with what uh, Richard said, uh, and just re-emphasizing two other points uh, with that. First, uh, uh, taking that historical perspective, the example Richard gave 20 years, but I think it's been decades and decades when these kind of suppressions in other aspects have been dealt with sometime with much more speed, but why is it that uh, uh, crimes to this magnitude uh, against a uh, specific gender, against women, are not being dealt with the sense of urgency. And therefore, there is a need of a collective awakening uh, in all of those involved in international uh, 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 lawmaking uh, bodies to, to seriously engage in this discourse and move faster uh, and then uh, especially on the point of uh, uh, amendments of that clause of room status requires an assembly and requires adoption and all of that process. And if that is September is around the corner, and then that 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 uh, could have, if there was a will, that, that could be. But therefore, the second point is for us to see a lot of people here are those activists for that, for them to see that happen, it's required a movement similar to Me Too movement to an extent to put enough pressure for some to take actions in presenting at least a, 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 a legal interpretation to be adopted or to be at least an opinion by the Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights on this issue so that it could be a, a, a ground making for it. Uh, I think beginning with Office of High Commissioner for, for Human Rights with an opinion on this will make it much more easier for uh, uh, legal processing uh, uh, of, of additional or uh, amendment uh, into the statute. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, Nada, I don't see any, any further raised hands. And also looking at the clock, uh, we're already about 10 minutes in injury time, which even by the FIFA's new rules is quite a lot. Um, so I'm afraid I, we have come to the end of our discussion today. Um, so on behalf of the OSA Institute, I would like to thank uh, our four uh, standing panelists, uh, Dimitro, Richard, Nada, and Victoria, for all your excellent contributions. Um, and of course, everyone else in the, in, in the audience, uh, I know on the European continent, at least, it was a very beautiful uh, June day, so that you took the time to be here. So really appreciate it. Uh, this has been the uh, the final SAL lecture before the summer, but we've quite a few more in the pipeline, and they also relate to uh, us as work in, uh, in Ukraine. And I would like to uh, encourage you to to regularly check our website, or what's even easier, um, to uh, sign up to our mailing list. So thanks again to all panelists and to everyone in the audience, and um, it's great to be here. Pleasure and privilege to to moderate the discussion.
and see you hopefully again in the near future. Thank you very much, colleagues, and uh, thank you, uh, Tariq, and especially Nader and Victoria for your paper. Pleasure to join you. Thank, thank you, you Ron. Yeah, thank you, Tarek. Victoria, thank you. Dimitri, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Dimitri.